What? Well, you know, the important thing about growing older and getting wiser is learning when you shouldn't make a what's xing my wise joke about a series of profoundly horrific crimes against humanity. And yeah. I, I've i grown as a person. So Good job. we're just going to go into the episode and not think at all about what it is <laughs> I was going to say before I stopped myself and narrowly avoided cancellation. This is Behind the Bastards, a podcast about the worst people in all of history, of whom I would have been one had I completed the sentence that this introduction was meant to be initially as it was originally planned. But I didn't, so you motherfuckers can't cancel me. That's right. I'm going to go. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this also means that you will never be installed as 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 the leader of a country by the CIA. I don't don't say never. Don't say never. You never like what do what do you 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 I mean anybody look a man can dream Christopher <laughs> we're talking more about Manchuria today we just went through a lot of war crimes uh where are where are we where are we where what do you 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 where what do you where where what where what is it time where is what it, is it time for the reckoning as you titled yeah. it is as, yeah it is teach time. it to you the reckoning fuck yeah spicy. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. So we we are back in Japan. We are back in 1945 and we are back in, well, I guess we are back in, we are back in the U.S. occupation. And okay. Now I, I think a, a pretty natural reaction to, to seeing the, U, uh, the, the words, a U.S. military occupation is to assume that's going to go badly. And it is, but it actually didn't start out that way. And it didn't start out that way because the first phase of, of the, the sort of Japanese occupation by the U.S. is run by a bunch of New Dealers. And these guys looked at Japan and were like, okay, so what if instead of fascism, we did the New Deal? And so they mm-hmm. do a bunch of stuff that's like really leftist. Like, like for example, the, the big one that you could never do in the U.S., uh, they do this huge land reform package where they, they force all the landlords who own a certain amount of land to like sell it to their tenants and you know, and so there, 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 there's like, there's like two years, you know, about 1945, 1947, where you know the U.S. like is actually kind of trying to make Japan like mm-hmm. better and more democratic and less shit. But all of that comes to an end in 1947, basically as a result of the Cold War. And this, this is called the reverse course, and and it signifies basically when American business interests like take control of 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 japan and you mm-hmm. know like in 1950 they they do this thing called the red purge where they they like they just they just do they, they use mass firing of like suspected communists and just mm-hmm. like yeah and, and anyone who's sort of like vaguely associated with the left just like, gets fired from their jobs both in the government and the it, private sector this is this it, is coordinated it, like and if i'm not mistaken authority. this is kind of around the time when there's also a lot of protests against the american occupiers because a bunch of gis are are raping ladies yeah, uh, that's, which is like yeah. another major thing that's that that drives a lot of like the 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 early protests um, yep. post war in Japan. Yeah, they're also just like shooting people, and we'll we'll get mm-hmm. more into soldiers just randomly murdering people. Excellent. Um, but you know, I guess actually speaking of soldiers randomly murdering people, so one of the reasons why fascism is never really sort of like crushed in Japan is that. The head of uh, G2, which is the Army's intelligence section, is also a fascist. And, you know, oh, this, no, this is... Oh, no, no way! Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I said, like, this is not me calling Charles A. Willer be a fascist. Though, like, this guy is going to go on to become, like, Franco's promoter in Europe. Like, MacArthur <laughs> calls him a fascist. Wow! MacArthur, yeah, like, <laughs> the guy who suggested nuking cities in China yep. to win the Korean War. <laughs> if that dude calls you a fascist... Yeah. You're probably pretty fucking fashy. You know, and, and and this is a big issue because Willerby's job, like the, the actual job he is there to do is to like just completely obliterate the rest of Jap- the Japanese fascist organizations and Japanese fascist societies. And what he does instead is he used the G2's counterintelligence corps to do union busting and staging false flag attacks and blaming them on the Socialist Party. And cool. he does he does one other thing that's both incredibly important to this story and important to Japanese history. Uh, he decides he wants to start negotiating with the Yakuza in order to sort of like use them as a weapon against the left. And in order to oh, do rad. this, <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great. You can, you can see where this is going. Uh, he, 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 he goes I mean, to, versions of this happen in Italy with the mafia oh, yeah. too, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I, you know, the Italian mafia is interesting because every once in a while they like will back a leftist. 
Like that's like mm-hmm. how the sort of weird red brigade stuff happened. But like right. the Yakuza, they're just fascist. Like there's no yeah. well, that's good. Yeah. For them. Yeah. It's 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 great. And yeah, and so so Willerby goes to Tsukumo prison, which is like the this is this is the giant war criminal prison where the US is holding all the war criminals. And he meets with Kishi's cellmate. Now, Kishi's cellmate is a guy named uh Kodama Yoshio who is, he's like a giant Yakuza boss. He's involved in the drug trade. He was also arrested for his plot, his part in the incredibly named League of Blood incident in 1932, which is this giant like fascist plot to just assassinate a bunch of business owners, liberal politicians. And, you know, so he gets arrested for, this is 1932, and he gets arrested and then he gets released. And then, you know, because again, the Japanese empire is just a giant cartel with like a state attached to it. He spends the entire war as Japan's like procurement guy which means that he's running around like basically trading heroin for like tungsten radium guns and like other stuff to fight the war. And so Willerby meets with this guy because he also, you know, he still has a bunch of Yakuza connections and he has like $175 million that he made from the war just like on him. And so Willerby cuts a deal with Kodama that's like, okay, I'll get you out of war crimes jail if you become an American intelligence asset. And Kodama's like, this is just all wins. And so he, Kodama like immediately, like basically reforms this like, I don't even I guess you call it like the United Front of like crime and fascism. It's like it's it's this group. It's, it's this association of like four hundred right wing like fascist and criminal organizations that Kodama just like runs, and you know he he's gonna spend the next thirty years basically just running Japanese politics from the from the shadows and be, being basically like the Yakuza politics guy. Now, Kishi, how Kishi escaped the noose in nineteen forty eight is a subject of some debate. Like, so the U.S. doesn't charge him with the sex slavery crimes or, like, the the forced labor crimes. What he's charged with is uh, violating, like, crimes against the peace, which is, like, starting an offensive war. But, like, even that, even if you just stick to that, like, he is the guiltiest man in human history. Like, he signed the declaration of war against the U.S. Like, it's oh, cool. the easiest conviction ever. Like, it, yeah, that and, really and, also and, ought to, like, just as a rule, if you're, like, someone else who lives in that country and a guy is like, hey, I want to continue being influential. You know me. I'm the guy who helped declare war in the U.S. You yeah. would think that, like, <laughs> everyone would be like, well, we shouldn't be listening to anything you say. Yeah. you, you <laughs> That would didn't think. go very well. Uh, you, you would think. And, you know, I, they're, they're, I, I've seen some stories that talk about, like, some sort of like group of American businessmen interceded on his behalf. I don't know how reliable that is. The other explanation, and this this is true regardless of exactly what happened to Kishi, is that like the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal just kind of gave up like trying to actually prosecute people because it was too much work and it was like the Cold War was happening and they just didn't care anymore. And so they do just like a bunch of absolutely half ass proceedings and you know, they they rush like Tojo to the gallows and a few people, other people they wanted to kill. And then everyone else just goes free. And so on Christmas Eve, 1948, Nobusika Kishi, the man who enslaved Manchuria and ran the fascist war machine, walked out of prison. And oh, because, his bro- because his brother, future prime minister uh, Ido Isaku, uh, Sato Isaku, is the cabinet chief secretary, Kishi is immediately driven to the prime minister's house. Come where, on. How good. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he's immediately driven to the prime minister's house where he trains his, pr- trains his prison oranges for a business suit and utters the immortal words, quote, well, I guess we're all Democrats now. Oh, God. Ew. Ew. Oh, yeah. Ew. Gross. Yeah. Not good. Bad. Not yep. cool or good. Ew. Uh, uh. And, and, and thus, and thus Nobusuke Kishi, arch-fascist bureaucrat, entered the new world of electoral politics. Oh, God. That's You yeah, love depressing. to see it. Yeah. yeah. It's like if Werner von Braun had run for Congress. Yep. I, yeah. As opposed to just running NASA. Yeah. And, you know, okay. So initially he, he starts put, putting together basically like the old fascist base. So like he gets some small business owners. He gets some like old school 1931, like fascist terrorists. Yeah. He gets, he gets his friends at Nissan are like, yeah, we loved this Manchuria shit. Like we're, we're giving him all of our money. And the, the other, you know, one of the, the other, like, very disturbing things about what happened after the war is that, so, you know, I talked to the last episode, Kishi, Kishi founds this thing called the Ministry of Munitions, which is just, like, the super, it, like, super, it, like, ministry that all, does all this planning stuff. And basically all of his old, like, fascist reform bureaucrat buddies who are in the Ministry of Munitions keep their jobs, and that whole, the ministry just turned into the Ministry of International Trade and Industry. And, you know, and MIDI is, that's called MIDI, MIDI is the core of Japanese post-war development. And it's, you know, it, it's all the old fascist shit that, that Kishi was doing before, except 
The difference is that it's it's now being used to sort of like it's being used to 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 fuel the American war machine in Korea and Vietnam instead of fueling the Japanese war machine also in Korea and Vietnam. So, yeah, this is purging the fascists is going well. And mm-hmm. when I say going well, I mean, in 1952, the U.S. just like gave up any semblance of trying to get rid of fascism and just unpurged yeah. everyone they'd purged. We, we pardoned a lot of them. We gave the others jobs. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, and the interesting thing with Kishi, so so the, the prime minister at the time is Yoshida Shigeru, who was like, this is not a good guy. Like he was also a fascist for the war. But he tells the Americans, do not unpurge this guy. Like, do not unpurge Kishi. And it's extremely funny because, you know, as I mentioned last episode, like, Yoshida is, is like, is related to Kishi. Like, you remember that uncle that Kishi really liked who, like, raised him for a little bit? Yeah. For, uh, yeah. So that guy's daughter, like, is Yoshida's wife. Like, they know each other. Like, Kishi knows <laughs> this guy's family. And he's still just like, do not do this. Do not let this guy come back into politics. And the U.S. is just like... No, fuck it. Well, he's back. <laughs> yeah, Kishi's back. He'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, and you know, so, so Kishi. You Kishi may not creates. have heard of us. We're the United States. Yeah, <laughs> we don't think things through. <laughs> nope. Uh. Well, I mean, you know, I would say this. This works out great for the U.S. Um, oh, good. Yeah, Hooray. yeah, it's, it's great. We're yeah, and you know, and K- Kishi. So Kishi runs this this electoral federation thing in 1952, and it just gets like destroyed. Like because 1952, everyone's like, we don't like this guy, and I mean, he has a, like he has a lot of money. He has like hundreds of millions of yen, and so they get like whacked. And so Kishi starts like wheeling around the political scene, going, okay, like what can I latch on to? And like he he almost joins the right wing of the Socialist Party, which would have been the single weirdest pit of it I've ever seen in my life. But his brother convinced him to join this the the ruling sort of center right liberal party instead, and you know, like. This is Yoshida's party, and Yoshida like doesn't like Kishi, but the Liberal Party is also falling apart. So he's like, okay, we need Kishi's support. And so in 1953, Kishi joins the par, par- um, join- joins the uh, party and wins a seat in the Diet. Now Yoshida, Yoshida's getting help from a lot of places in that election because 1953 is the first post-war election after the American occupation. And and if you know anything about uh, elections that happen in, in fascist countries immediately after. Uh, the the end of World War Two, you know that Yoshida is being backed by the CIA. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah if you, you know, know anything that happened about elections that happened in these countries after World War Two, you know that they didn't. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, yeah. This is interesting because it's like I think this story is weirder yeah. than than like the Italian stories. Like you know, and, and this, I mean, you know, I guess we're, so. So the way this is funded is that at the beginning of the Korean War. Like, the U.S. needed a bunch of tungsten, and American intelligence basically was like, we need to keep the Socialist Party from literally ever taking power, like, at all costs. And so they talked to Kodama, who's that, that Yakuza guy from before the war, who Willerby had, like, broken out of jail. And they get him to smuggle a bunch of tungsten that had been left over from Japan's World War II stockpiles to the U.S., and then they, like, they pay him $10 million, and the CIA throws in $2.8 million of their own, and that money is, like, that, that, that money is how the Liberal, the Liberal Party, like, wins 1953 elections. Cool. It's, it's great. It's great. I mean, and it's gonna get worse. That seems fine. I bet we did good stuff with all that tungsten. Yeah, we absolutely bombed the shit I bet out it, of Korea. It didn't and... get bought, fired into multiple countries. Yep. Worth yep. of civilian. It's, it's great. Okay. Anyway, great. we all. Yeah. Now, yeah. So, so you know, Kishi Kishi gets elected as part of the Liberal Party, but you know, Kishi is a backstabbing son of a bitch. And he immediately turns on Yoshida and, like, starts denouncing him. Yoshida kicks him out of the party. But Kishi's able to get this, like, breakaway faction to join him. And he forms something called the Democratic Party. And through a lot of incredibly complicated electoral bullshit, like, they're able to oust Yoshida as prime minister. And then Kishi has this giant plan to, like, reunify the two wings of the, uh, the like, re- basically reunify the two wings of the, the of the right. There's, like, his wing is the Democratic Party, and then there's the Liberal Party, and he has to reunify them. And the reason he wants to do this is because he wants to control it. But the other reason, that the reason it actually happens is that the Socialist Party had split in, like, 1948 or something. In 1955, they come back together. And that just, like, freaks all the conservatives out, and they're like, okay, okay, fine. Like, we'll... We'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll join this new party. And the new party they form is called the Liberal Democratic Party. Now, this is important. The reason I spent so much time talking about this is that the LDP is the single most important party in Japanese politics. In, in the 66 years since they were founded in 1955, the LDP has been out of power for six. They were in power for the other six. Jesus 60. Christ. Yeah. This is, like, Japan, uh, is, Japan is almost a one record. party state. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. And, you know, and this is, this is Kishi's party. Like he is the guy who single-handedly built this party. This party would not exist 
if Kishi had not gone into the liberal party, like tore them apart and then forced them to join his breakaway faction. And, you know, like he's the reason why it exists. And this, this party, like this is the party that's the basis of the entire modern Japanese political system. Cool. And yeah, it's great. Kishi, you know, he, he makes himself the general secretary of, of, of the, of the party and wins, you know, and in, in his first election, he wins an absolute majority in the diet for the LDP. But, you know, instead, instead of becoming prime minister himself, he spends his time sort of biting, like sort of building up American support for him. Now, you know, we talked about this, the CDP, I mean, the CIA had been heavily involved with the Liberal Party and they've, they've been heavily involved with the Liberal Democratic Party, like from the start. Um, I mean, this, this, this is from a New York Times article. We financed them, said Alfred C. Lomer Jr., who ran the CIA's Far East operations from 1955 to 1958. We depended on the LDP for information. He said the CIA had used the payments both to support the party and recruit informants from it from its earliest days. And so the CIA, like, they're working with the LDP on, like, a candidate-by-candidate candidate basis. Like, they, they, this, they, 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 like the, the CIA has their own electoral guys, and the electoral guys will, like, go to a candidate and go, we need you to win this seat, and they'll, like, hand, like personally hand them money. And so, you know, this is, this is, this is where you get the first of the Dolus brothers entering, entering the sort of political arena. Hell yeah. And then... This, and then, it, like, actually, I saw that before. It's in 1955, you also get the second uh, Dulles brother, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, who, mm-hmm. like, basically My just boys. straight up, yeah, like, he just, like, like straight up, 1955, is, like, the liberal, like, he he's, like, tells the Japanese, like, the liberal party will unify with the Democratic Party, and, like, if you don't, like, vague threat insert here. And so, John Foster Dulles, directly responsible in many ways both the Dulles brothers are responsible for Kishi, like forming the most important political party in, in, in the history of Japan. And all, all of this ends with Kishi becoming prime minister in 1957. And he, he just immediately starts doing crime. So he, well, yeah, he, I mean, what else are you going to do? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like this Kishi's Kishi's like a, a Kishi's an incredible money launderer um, from, from his time in Manchuria. Like, you know, and, and, and he, he devises a scheme to like make some money off of the reparations payments that Japan had to pay to like the countries that it invaded after the war. And so he, he basically what he does is he negotiates to have these reparations payments like paid in Japanese goods and services. And so he buys those Japanese goods and services with state money from his own corporate political allies. And oh, then, good. Okay. yeah, he turns, yeah, it's great. It's great. He's, he's, he's using the reparations payment to like pay off his like fascist buddies. And then he does the exact same thing to like the, the Japanese uh, uh, foreign aid like projects it's also all just kishi's like buddies paying themselves and you know kishi he also like he develops this system of like so kishi like constantly rotates through cabinets in the time that he's prime minister like constantly and and the reason he's doing this is because uh it's, it's basically a way to buy off his political allies so like you know you you, you give an ally a cabinet minister and then they get a loot a bunch of money and then once they've taken enough money you put in the next person you put in the next person you put in the next person and you know he he's also just like <laughs> He's not only doing this with with like sort of politicians and like businessmen. He's doing this with the yakuza. So what if the the yeah? I mean, he he makes like like a, a sworn yakuza guy, uh, like his Ministry of Agriculture, and then there's the wonderfully named Bambuko Ono, who Kishi that is a like, cool name. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and he he uh, Kishi makes this guy the Secretary General of the Liberal Democratic Party. And he's and he stays in that position until uh, Ono dies in 1965. And Ono is wonderful because he he gives a speech to 2,000 Yakuza members in the 60s, where like he just straight up says like Yeah, I'm Yakuza, but I do it by being a politician instead of being a criminal. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it rules. And so and you know the other thing that's happening is that Kishi's Kishi's still you know Kishi's connected to sort of Kodama and Kodama's like whole like Yakuza American intelligence network. And so when, when Lockheed Martin is trying to get uh, the Japanese Defense Force to buy their, like, F-104 Starfighter over Northrop Grumman's uh, F-11F, uh, their guy in Japan, who just happens to be an old G-2 intelligence guy, is like, I know a guy. And the guy that he knows is Kodama, who he pays, like, millions of dollars in bribes to. Is like They give him, like, a $600,000 commission on every plane they sell to get this sold to the, to the Japanese government. And so Kodama goes to his Yakuza connections in the government, which is, you know, his Yakuza buddy and newly mentioned LDP Secretary General Bamako Ono and his good friend Nobusuke Kishi. And Kishi buys the Starfighter and Lockheed just like keeps Kodama on retainer for like the next 30 years. And 
you know, I, I want to give people a sense of like how embedded this like intelligence fascist Yakuza network is in the LDP, because it's, it's not like this is a thing that's only Kishi and it goes away. Like, like in, in the 1970s, Kodoma gets hired again by Lockheed to do exactly the same thing. And he pays out like several million dollars in bribes. Like he bribes the prime minister <laughs> again. And this time he gets caught and, he, you know, he, and he he took so much money from like the Americans and Brazilian people that like he managed to piss off both the far right and the far left. And so, you know, they, they start protesting his house. And on 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 May 23rd, 1976, a fascist porn star named Misua Maneo, who'd been a huge Kodama fanboy. Rents Boy, a that plane. shouldn't exist. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's great. It's going to get better. Uh, yeah. So see, he rents a plane. He like circles Kodama's house, like shouting pro imperial slogans into a microphone. And then. Like he screams bonsai and flies the plane into his house. Like this is this is in 1976. Kodama's that's house is kind of rad, to be honest. That's that's <laughs> you know what you got to give it up sometimes. That uh, critical support, very well, you know, cool, Un- sucks, undeniably though, rad move. But Kodama lives through this. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, but a does guy, he really? A guy kamikaze in his house. <laughs> In 1970s, like a fascist porn star kamikaze his house and he lived through it. It's just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- that is basically the end of him in politics, but it's like, it's, it's great. It's great. Um, yeah, that's, you know, that is a flex. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, this is, yeah, this is a, this is a profoundly fascist party with profoundly fascist people in it. And yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so back, back in 1957, uh, Kishi's dealing with like his first real political scandal, which is that a uh, on January 30th, 1957, a U.S. soldier named Gerard, like basically just for fun, shot an empty grenade cartridge out of a, a grenade launcher at a Japanese woman who was like mm. collecting shell casings and military base sulfur scrap. And she dies. Oh, God. Yeah. And, you know, and this this pisses off everyone in Japan. And, you know, I mean, especially it's like she's it's revealed later she's a mother of six and everyone just loses their mind. And Eisen, and, you know, and, and there's this huge fight over it. And Eisenhower wants to like try him in an American court. And Eisenhower like is forced to, is like literally forced to like try him in a, in a Japanese court because like if, if he tried to do it in an American court, like people would have literally like brick by brick dismantled every American, like American military base on the, in the islands. And so... Kishi's main concern here is that this is going to like fuck up his political stuff. And so he, 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 he develops this plan and he, where, where he, he's going to go to, to Eisenhower and make a bunch of demands about this U S Japan security treaty. Mm-hmm. And this thing, this is like one of the other things that's been causing protests is that this treaty is like signed in 1951 originally. And it's, it's really weird. Like it lets the U S like send troops into Japan to put down quote internal riots or disturbances, oh. which is, yeah, there's and the other like in terms of like a peace treaty, and the other thing is it lets them in, it lets them in, it lets the U.S. involve itself in civil wars, and like you know a bunch of the Japanese commentators point out like there's like no precedent for this, like there's never been a peace treaty that like between two free nations that allows this. So you know, and you get these massive protests, like people, people, people like build giant wooden fortresses and man them for like forty years in the middle of American artillery ranges, like. There's all of this stuff. And, you know, Eisenhower meets with Kishi and is like, and Kishi just goes like, like you have to revise this tree. And Eisenhower is like, okay. And so Kishi like stakes basically his entire political career on, on, on revising this, this U S Japan security treaty, which becomes known as Anpo. And, you know, like it really looks like he's going to like pull this off. He's going to get treaty revisions. He's going to be incredibly popular until Kishi just like, Kishi just Kishi just got like that extra bit too fascist, and the extra bit too fascist was he he tried to pass something called the Police Duties Execution Law, Ooh, which that is like sound good. That yeah, like is, that's that just already seems like we're on a bad start. Yeah, yeah, like like this this is a police law so fascist that like his other fascist hardliner buddies like in the LDP are like we won't let you pass this because you'll get you'll get eaten alive. Yeah, it basically like what it, what it does is it it lets it lets the Japanese it would have let the Japanese police do warrantless warrantless searches and seizures. Oh cool. Yeah, and you know and everyone's like okay, so this is just like this is this this is this is pre-war fascism again. So, you know. Mm-hmm. 
And you know, I, you know, and I think I think he thinks he can get away with this because he's done a bunch of other like fascist culture war mm-hmm. sort of stuff. Like he 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 does this thing where he he makes everyone take these like moral lessons and like all the students take like moral lessons and has these like evaluations of teachers because he thinks there's like they're too communist and wants fascist propaganda like taught instead. And you know, I want to make it clear there is no parallel. <laughs> Between this and anything that is happening in the U.S. right now, uh, go back to sleep. There's nothing here. Everything's going to be fine. It's like, yeah, no, no, no one in the U.S. is raging a bunch of political campaigns about what teachers are teaching in school because they think it's too leftist. No, that has <sighs> not happened. But you know what does happen in the U.S.? Products and services? Uh, that's right. That's, that's, God willing, the only thing that will ever happen in this country in the future going forward. Because when you get right down to it, what else do we need? But products, services, and of course, the blissful, gooey, moist, sticky, what? cum-drenched Robert, product of products Stop and it. services. Stop it. What? Stop oh, it. okay. Stop it. Well, let's just go to ads. Gosh. Ah, we're back. Okay. Chris, please continue. Yes, Chris, please continue. <laughs> Sophie's angry at me because she doesn't like it when I say cum drenched while leading into an ad. Not at all. I don't think anybody enjoyed that. And if you did, please don't tell us. <laughs> I think our sponsors enjoy it, Sophie. Oh, no. All right. I mean, it could be Nissan. We, we, we could, could be, be Nissan. 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 Nissan this episode. That's fair. Yeah, the, it could the, be the, Nissan. I take yeah, it back. absolutely it could, in inappropriate. Fact be Nissan. Mm-hmm. So Kishi, yeah. So Kishi, Kishi, Kishi's gotten a bit too fascist. And he also, he does this thing where, so, so the, the way that like the norms of the Japanese political system worked was that like, you're supposed to, be, before you pass a bill, you're supposed to talk to the opposition about it. And then there's supposed to be a debate. And Kishi's just like, yeah, fuck that. Like, he's just like, snap introduces it without like with he basically he takes a snap vote to extend the diet and just like snap forces everyone to try to vote on it and this is like maximally bad politics by kishi like you know i say it's like the the norms of democracy are like actually important to japan and they're important because this is this is a country that was a decade and a half ago literally fascist and Kishi's trying to pass this bill that is bring fascism back and so you know everyone gets pissed off like three of his cabinet ministers resign and this also pulls the whole left together and they form something called the people's council and they start they start a general strike drop the bill and kishi and you know and they win and kishi forced to pull the bill and it you know it, it, it makes him way weaker politically and when, when he tries to get his security like uh, on po the security treaty ratified by by the diet those same groups form this even larger group called the people's council for preventing revision to security treaty and this thing is massive it's got a it's 134 different organizations in it um you know the, the biggest of them are the japanese socialist party the the general council of trade unions in japan who are a very powerful trade union uh federation uh and then there's zengokuren which is the 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 japanese radical student movement who we will we will talk more about in a little bit um yeah, the Japanese Communist Party is also sort of involved in this, but like they don't want to let them join for political reasons initially. But you know, the other thing about this, like, it's not just like leftist orgs. Like Japan's Professional Association Association for like Thespians is in this coalition. <laughs> like, yeah, there's you know, there, there's a lot of people who are like, there's a lot of groups that are like not inherently political groups that are in this. And interesting. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's you know, this, this is basically this is the product of like all the stuff the left has been doing for the past basically since the, since the war like ended. And so, you know, and, and these guys point out that, you know, so Kishi is able to get the clause out about the U.S. interfering to suppress riots and civil wars, but there's still a clause that says the U.S. is allowed to send troops to deal with, quote, all threats to Japan's peace and security, which, mm. you know, yeah. <laughs> threats to peace and security, like people doing politics we don't agree with. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is this so, going to end well? Sure. I, yeah, it's... Yeah, so, so the People's Council starts staging these, like, enormous protests. And, you know, they go on for a few months. It doesn't really do anything until Zengokuren, who is the, the, the radical student organization, goes rogue. And the important Hell thing about yeah. Zengokuren is that, like, so A, they're not directly tied to any of the parties, and B, they are, like, way more willing to fight the cops than anyone else here. Mm-hmm. And so the People's Council is planning this, like, massive series of protests. But Zengokuren looks at, like, you know, th- this is, like, their eighth giant protest. And Zengokuren goes, okay, well, those did nothing. So this one's not going to do anything either. So they form a plan to storm the Japanese parliament building. And 
you know, the People's Council like finds out about this plan and they're, they're like trying to stop Sengoku Ren from doing it. But Sengoku Ren like negotiates with like the, the Tokyo's like trade unions and they're able to just do it anyways. So, you know, 500,000 people across Japan and like 80,000 people in Tokyo show up to this protest. And like in the middle of the march, Sengoku Ren just like charges the police barricades, beats back the police and like forces their way into the diet and takes control of it. And, you know, they hold it for like a day and they leave. And people, people do not like this. Like the, the you know, like the, even like the socialist and Japanese part, communist party, like condemn them for it. And, you know, public opinion turns against them. And there's this whole like disaster. And, you know, and Sugoku Ren gets like a lot of shit for this because, you know, like they, they stormed, the, they stormed the diet building. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's worth remembering that like everyone else, like everything else the more moderate faction was doing just like didn't work. And what Zagokaran did here was drew an enormous amount of attention to the movement. And this is a, and you know, that, that's actually, that's a vital part of like what happens next. And what happens next is that the Socialist Party, the Socialist Party does like, I think like the funniest set of political tricks I've ever seen in my life where, you know, like they, they have, they have this whole thing they want to do where they're trying to just like, they're trying to delay the vote because I think if they delay the vote fast enough, like long enough, Kishi will just like get like kicked out of the prime ministership by his own party. And, you know, and this, they, they're able to drag this on until like, uh, 19, like 1960 and Kishi, like, you know, he, like Kishi's own party won't let him do a floor vote on the bill because like they're mad at him. And so on, on April 4th, 1970, he creates the on post special Redif- uh, special measures committee from loyal LDP members, which was called the uh, nickname the Onpo Kamikaze squad, which is, you know, th- this is his attempt to try to figure out like how to like get through all of like get get, get this like treaty through before his support collapse and like the diet session ends. And like literally the day the session is going to end and he's going to lose his opportunity to force his vote through, uh, he he starts doing his plan. And the, the Socialist Party like knows something bad is going to happen. So they hire a bunch of like, quote unquote, secretaries who they they, they, they hire them and they bring them in the building and they, they barricade the office of the, the speaker of the lower house. To, to keep him from leaving his office, which is something that, like, I wish, like, our politicians were like, it's like, man, our pol- like, our politics is, like, our parliament's so boring. Like, no- nobody's barricading the Speaker of the House, like, in their office. Yeah. It's very, it's very sad. You know, and, and, and this, and the Speaker, like, tells them to move, and they don't. And so he calls the police to remove the socialist diet members by force. And this is a huge deal. Um, Like, this is, this is the second time ever that the police have ever entered the diet chamber. And it's the only time before or since they've ever like physically removed diet members. And so, you know, this whole thing's being, being, being like broadcast on live TV. And there's, there's the police just like dragging these like parliament members out of this building, like kicking and screaming and like, you know, and, and they, they, they catch like the speaker, like fighting his way to the rostrum. And he calls a vote to extend the diet session, like two minutes before it's supposed to end. And like, he wins the vote and there's the camera. The camera is like, it it show it it pans and it shows all the LDP like ministers clapping and then it 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 pans and it pans to the other half of the diet and in the other half of the diet every single person in the opposition is gone there's none of them are there and because the opposition is completely gone uh Kishi makes this like unexpected snap vote to force a treaty through with no debate and you know and because of some like legal bullshit he's able to figure out a way that like the treaty will still go into effect even without the upper house approving it uh, as long as they just stay in session and the Japanese public like just they're unbelievably pissed off like even the pro-treaty people look at like the ex-fascist guy like removing the (laughs) opposition party by force and holding a previously unknown Mm, snap vote with no debate yeah Yeah. (laughs) like 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 they they watch like all of this is just on tv and it like like it sets off three general strikes and you know at this point the the protests basically become an anti-kishi movement and like everyone in the country like, including, like, the conservative newspapers are calling for him to resign. Like, the, biz- the business leaders turn on him to the point where, like, they start funding Zengokuren. Like, they start funding the, the, the communist student movement through, like, weird organized crime people because they're like, Zengokuren's mainstream faction is anti-Kishi. is anti Kishi. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah like, that's, that's how, like, wild this... And, you know, and, and like, the other thing is, like, other, like ordinary people just, like, start showing up to protests. And so, like, like, 30 million people, which is, like, a third of the total population shows up to, like, an anti-Kishi protest between 1959 and 1960. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's, like, it 
it pisses off. And this is this is like this is the defining event of like the sort of like the immediate post war generation. Like this is the thing they remember. Um, like so, we'll, we'll get to this in a little bit. But uh, Shinzo Abe, who was the longest serving Japanese prime minister, he he mm-hmm. came out of office like last year. So he's Kishi's grandson, and he talks about Good like God. how yeah he learned politics like like while he was on Kishi's knee and Kishi was telling him about what was happening in the streets. Oh, I bet yeah, that was fine. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not great. And, you know, you know, this part, though, is extremely funny. Like, there's there, there's a great story about just, like, this kindergartner, like, on the street who asked the famous political scientist, Ishida Takashi, why doesn't Kishi just resign already? <laughs> like, he, he's Good lost question. the kindergartners. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and the other thing, the other thing that's happening with this is that, so Eisenhower is supposed to show up in Japan um, on the 19th so he can be there for, for the 21st which is supposed to he's coming to this giant visit that's it's supposed to be like the 100th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the US and, and Japan and this is also the, the treaty goes into effect and so you know you on, on, on June 4th there's the largest general strike in Japanese history and then on the 15th there's another general strike that has 6.4 million people in it and, and at this strike you know, a, a bunch of like street performers, artists, and writers like go to like give a petition to the to the to Parliament, and they all get attacked by this like giant fascist mob with like wooden poles with nails in them, and the mobs is chanting, like, "We will kill you and beat and we and beat them dead." Jesus, and, yeah, and, like eighty people are injured, and again, like these these are like these are like like theater actresses, yeah, classic fascism yeah, stuff, it's, yeah. Yep. <laughs> It's like ah yes we 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 will beat these theater actresses and poets and this 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 will yeah. make us strong yeah that, that scans yeah and so eleven people are injured and eleven and so eighty people are injured and eleven people get hospitalized and meanwhile Zengokuren is like we're gonna storm the diet again and you know seems the, like it the, worked the last time <laughs> yeah well but the funny thing is this time it does work and it works because so they fight the cops for a long time and it's kind of a stalemate and the cops do this counterattack but in this counterattack they they trample a, a Tokyo University undergrad named Kambamichiko to death Oof. and oh. that yeah that causes the crowd to just like go wild because you know yeah. the police just trampled a child to death yeah, yeah. and so 4,000 students storm the diet and they hold it until 1 a.m. in these like running street battles with the police and this Good is Lord. where like like everyone turns on Kishi yeah like, you know the combination of the cops like murdered a girl and they beat up a bunch of theater actresses is mm-hmm. just too much and at this point it becomes clear that you know if Eisenhower comes to Japan they won't be able to keep him safe Right. Because they can't hold the streets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that could be a little bit of a faux pas for Japan. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and you know, and Kishi Kishi like really wants this to happen because like Eisen, the Eisenhower visit in the treaty, like this is this is like all this is like this is this is everything he's been working for since he became prime minister. And so he has this plan to like mobilize the self defense forces, which is what the Japanese army is called. Yeah, because like, euphemisms. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, but he so he tries to like he has this plan to like mobilize an entire division of like the army and march them through the streets to clear the streets and get Eisenhower in. And even like his like his his defense chief and the head of the national police is like, you can't do this. Like there will literally be an uprising. And so Kishi's like Kishi undeterred is like, okay, so I'm gonna go I'm gonna go to my Yakuza contacts. So he goes to Kodama and he has he has this plan to get 18,000 like Yakuza hardliners, like 10,000 guys who work for Yakuza's like street vendors and 10,000 like veterans, right? wing cult members to clear the streets. And like he has this, he's going to give them like the government's going to give them like trucks and like food and first aid teams and like command posts and two point three million dollars and like airplanes and helicopters. Oh, that couldn't end badly. Sure. Yeah. Well, and, and, and even his cabinet is like. Kishi, you can't do this. Like, you're going to start a civil war. Again, and- a lot of fascists <laughs> being like, boy, seems like that's too much fascism. Yeah, yeah. Kishi, Kishi is like, yeah, K- Kishi is the fascist that other fascists are like, whoa, hey, now, like, this is too much fascism. But and, you, know you know what's not too much fascism, Chris? Unless it's a Black Rifle Coffee ad, then. Unless it's another Black Rifle Coffee ad or an Exxon Mobil ad. Or, it's true. um,. One of those weird Christian cult ads we've been kind of getting. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, those or like, an those ad. Weird Christian or there things. was a, lit- yeah. a literal ad for the California Highway Patrol. Yeah, definitely Fuck an off. ad for chips. That's yeah. fascism. So, I don't know. 
There could be fascism, <laughs> lost, but it's I've, not. I've, I've lost the point that I was we trying to make here. We don't endorse the fascist ads, but it's time for ads, and we're sorry if it's something random we didn't select, and it's horrifying. We, we do apologize. Uh, we live in an engine of pain. Mm-hmm. Here's some ads. Ah, good stuff. Well, we had some ads. All right, I want to hear how this all gets resolved now that this guy's been like, what if we, uh, what if we, what if we, what if we twist that fascism dial up to 11? And all of his friends were like, that, that kind of seems a little bit high because it seems like we've pissed everybody off with all of the violence we've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it, it ends, I'm not going to say well, but, you know, Kishi eventually backs down. And is just like, okay, Eisenhower, like, if you come, we can't protect you. And so Eisenhower cancels his visit. And on, on the day of the treaty supposed to be ratified, 300,000 people show up around the diet in Tokyo. But, you know, they, they can't actually stop the treaty from being ratified. And so, you know, because the treaty is being ratified automatically, there's nothing they can do. And so they sort of, they stand there and, you know, it's this very sort of grim scene. Everyone's wearing black armbands and like black bandanas mm-hmm. to celebrate, you know, to sort of mourn like the death of a protester. But, you know, there's nothing they can really do. And, like, the, the next day, there's this general strike, and there's, like, some more protests the day after. But Kishi, Kishi has the final document he needs to sign, like, smuggled to him in a candy box so it couldn't be stolen by protesters. Nice. Yeah, and so he signs it, and, you know, like, the next month on, on J- July 15th, Kishi is forced to resign, and the movement just collapses. So, Ooh. you know, it, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Like, on the one hand, they got Kishi. This, this is, this is the only consequence that Kishi is ever going to face in his entire life. That's, that's not quite true. It's one of exactly two consequences he's ever going to face in his entire life, and he survives both of them. And But, you know, on the other hand, like, this treaty still went through. And, you know, the, the, the sort of left that had built up to stop this becomes incredibly demoralized, and they, spr- and they splinter and fragment, and yeah. And Kishi, you know, because okay, so this is the end of Kishi's, like, mainstream political career. Um... But, you know, he, he doesn't go away. He still, he sort of stays around behind the scenes as this, like, it's kind of like this fixer. And, you know, and he, he does, he does a few more things at the end of the war. At the end of the war. Yeah, he sounds like he's kind of nixon a little bit where he's, yeah. he's, he's got some, he's got some soft influence, but also nobody wants to really be seen in public with the guy. Yeah. Well, okay, I, I will say there are a few people who do want to be be uh, seen in public with this guy, and the the biggest of those is called the Unification Church, which is this like oh shit, yeah, yeah, this yeah. fanatically anti communist religious Great. cult, yeah, that that allegedly yeah. kidnaps and brainwashes children, allegedly, allegedly, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and Kishi like so Kishi. Kishi is the guy responsible for bringing these people like into the LDP's base and like like the, so the head of the head of this guy uh, this party is a guy named Moon and he like yeah. so he gets evicted like convicted of tax fraud in like the nineties or in the eighties and nineties but you know there, there's a thing in Japan by by the in the he gets convicted in the U S and there's a thing in, J- in Japanese law where like if you've been convicted of a crime you can't enter the country now mm-hmm. so this should have stopped Moon from coming to Japan. But like the vice president, you know, even like even even in the 90s, like the Moonies are are still like so firmly embedded in the LDP that even in the 90s, like like the vice the vice president of Japan personally intercedes and allows them to enter the country illegally. And it's yeah, it's great. This is this this is what Kishi's doing in his sort of like last days. Yeah. And, you know, one, one other thing. One very weird thing happens at the very end of this, which is that the day before he resigns, Kishi's at this like dinner gala and this dude stabs him like six times. And then he gives this extremely weird quote that was like, like it, 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 it's something, it, it, it's something like, well, yeah, I stabbed him six times, but if I was trying to kill him, he would be dead. And there's, there's all this, and nobody actually knows why he tried to assassinate Kishi or didn't try to assassinate him and said just stabbed him six times. Um, there, there's a lot of theories. Like, the guy was, like, an old fascist from, like, the 30s. He was, like, 60 at this point. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his stated response was that he talked to the family of, like, the, the, the girl that had died. But, like, that doesn't make any sense because, like, this guy's a fascist. And there's yeah. another theory that, like, this is a Yakuza hit. Because um, Bamako Ono, like, 
was pissed off that Kishi wouldn't help him be prime minister. So he was just like, okay, I'll, I'll send a guy to stab you. I don't know. The, the, yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of very weird theories about this, but, you know, it, it's sort of unclear what happens. And, you know, Kishi, Kishi survives this. And, you know, even even though the LDP, like, is now Kishi-less, quote-unquote, the structures and political organizations that he put in place are, you know, they're they're still here to this day. And that brings us to Kishi's grandson, Shinzo Abe, the longest surfing prime minister in Japanese history, who uh, finally left office last year because of an ulcer in his rectum, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know... <laughs> Critical support to his <laughs> rectum oh, ulcer. Oh, man. Yep. <laughs> oh, gosh. No. Didn't no, he, Abe. It's not good when I laugh in unison with Robert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes good things happen to good people. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Now, Abe, Abe is a men, m- member of a group called Nippon Kagai, which is a fascist group that, according to a U.S. congressional report, believes that, quote, Japan should be applauded for liberating much of East Asia from Western colonial powers, that the 1946 and 1948 Tokyo war crimes tribunals were illegitimate, and that the killings by Japanese troops during the 1937 Nanjing massacre were exaggerated or fabricated. And they also openly call for a restoration of the monarchy and institution of Shinto as a state religion. And, and Abe himself has, like, repeatedly stated that Japanese military sex slaves, he, he uses the term comfort women because, you know, the euphemisms help him do denialism, but he, sure. you know, he, he, like, has said on multiple occasions that these sex slaves were never forced to be raped. Oh, good. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that's okay. Good. Cool dude. Yeah. No, yeah. bad guy. Sweet. Yeah. And, you know, and he's also, he's also a big champion. He's like the, like, the champion of, like, so one of Kishi's like other signature issue when he was a politician was rearming Japan because he was pissed off that like Japan couldn't still be a like and when I say rearming I don't mean defense force like he wants like he wants Japan to he be wants able to Japan war to, again. to have an effective military that can invade shit yeah 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 he wants he wants he wants to be an empire again and yeah. Abe is also like a giant uh, rearmament person sure and ABR you know, baby. And, yeah and he also he visits something called there's there's, there's a shrine called the. Uh, Yasukune Shrine, which is this shrine to like soldiers who died serving the Japanese emperor, and you know this the shrine has this this thing called the Book of Souls, which like has the name of like everyone who died like serving for the emperor or whatever. It's like two million people on it. Now in mm-hmm. this book are a thousand sixty eight people who were convicted of war crimes, and also the fourteen Class A war criminals who died and were executed, who are also considered martyrs. And th- this includes mm-hmm. Tojo. And it's, it's, yeah. And, you know, now for, for very obvious reasons, uh, China and Korea and both the Koreas, this is like the, one of the few things both Koreas like really completely agree on is that they get absolutely pissed off about prime ministers visiting their shrine, visiting, you know, a shrine to the people who enslaved, raped and murdered tens of billions of their people. But, you know, Abe did it anyways, because modern Japan is Kishi's Japan. Despite the protests, despite the strikes, despite a third of the country taking to the streets, he won. The only thing he didn't get was rearmament, and so, you know, the mass rapes in Korea and Vietnam will be left to the Americans, not the Japanese. But we all now live in the world that Kishi created. Cool. Yeah. All right. Robert, what a happy promised... story you told us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, you know, I promised at the, at, at, at the beginning of this episode that at the end of the episodes, I, I would ask you, is, is this the worst rehabilitation of a fascist war criminal? <sighs> in terms of, like, the actual amount of power he got? Probably. Yeah, I think I think probably Um, because, yeah, you've got like guys like Von Braun, but like Von Braun was bad and it's fucked up that he got rehabilitated. But the thing he went on to do wasn't bad. It was putting helping to put a man on the moon, which is like fine. Um, And you've got I don't know. There was that Nazi general who the CIA used to set up a spy ring and he did some fucked up stuff, but I think yeah. had uh, certainly had less geopolitical influence than yep. this guy. Yeah. I think this, this is definitely, I'm <laughs> racking my brain, but I'm not coming up yep. with, with one to top it. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Whew. Uh, should have started this episode with what's rehabilitating my fascists. That would have been better. Mm, that would have been <laughs> a mm-hmm. probe. Mm hmm. And it turns out the what is my government. Yeah. You love yeah. to see it. You love yeah. to see it. Well, Chris, is that is that the entire thing? Yeah. What do you? Wow. What do you? What do you, Chris? I don't do feel you, good about that, to be honest. What do you? Not a good tale. What do you, I don't either. What do you? What do you? What do you? What do you think Nicolas Cage's hair smells like? Nicolas Cage's hair. 
Yeah, what I do you think like his hair smells like? I've been looking at a picture of him for the last three hours. <laughs> that, t- that explains this, this, so much. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Chris, you have, I have, I have a guess. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it smells very good. Because, like, you know, is, isn't Nicholas Cage like smells constantly? Good. Okay. Well, because isn't he constantly like doing bad movies because he needs money for his like? Isn't it like an elephant habit? He has like some weird. No, thing he's he's addicted on. to buying dinosaur skulls. Dinosaur, yeah. ah, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think his hair smells like nail polish remover with a hint of poop. See, I was going to say fake apples, but like the the specific fake apple smell that they put in like agricultural products, like medicine when for horses, like ivermectin fake apples. That's fair. Hint of poop. I don't know. We'll see. If you've smelled Nicolas Cage, hit us up on social media. Let us know. Tell us who's right. One of us has to be. I think you might be right, though. I think it might smell like that really bad apple flavored like alcohol. Also. Yeah, a little bit of that. A little bit of that. hint of poop. (laughs) All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Someone out there has smelled Nicolas Cage's hair and they'll let us know who's right. Let us know. Let us know. That's Mm -hmm. really, really what we're That way we're not just. we're not just been staring at a photo of Nicolas Cage (laughs) for three hours? Let's get back to that. (laughs) Because it was, it's been a long day, Sophie. Everybody needs something to, you know, know. perk them up. Six hours before The halfway point. (laughs) Look, at the midway point of the day, some people have another cup of coffee. Some people stare wordlessly at a photograph of Nicolas Cage while I mean, their friend talks about war fine. crimes for three hours. Chris, where can people yeah. follow you? Uh, yeah, you, you, you can follow me being extremely depressed about this at itmechr3 on Twitter. Yeah. Um, if you want to read a slightly less depressing thing that I wrote, um, I, I wrote a piece for Laosan that's like about Tiananmen, which... I swear is less depressing than this, if only sort of marginally. Um, yeah. And yeah, I also I, I, I work I work for Cool Zone now, so I'm on mm-hmm. Yeah, expect I'm a on, lot of Chris a lot of other face. things. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You can't get rid of me now. Nope. So have a good day and remember, tell us what Nicolas Cage's hair smells like. Yep. yep. yep.